Well, let me take a moment to welcome you. Very excited you're here with us today. And if this is your first time with us, uh, we want you to know that we've been expecting you. And uh, we are very, very glad that you've chosen to worship with us here at North Star today. We're kicking off a new series this week entitled Stress Under New Management. Now, um, you know, when I felt like God was leading me to preach on this over the next few weeks, uh, you know, I got to be honest with you. I've been talking to many of you and uh, didn't realize how much traction online this was going to get. People are stressed out. And uh, many of us probably in some ways are dealing with stress in our own lives. If you're not here today and you're not stressed, then consider that a blessing um, because I know a lot of people have said the past two years have been very, very difficult for them. And so I want to welcome all of those who are watching us online. I know we have a lot of people joining us today that are kind of checking us out uh, because they specifically want to know about this idea of stress under new management. And um, what I'm talking about here is just simply this. The current management probably is not working the way you're managing stress, and therefore we have to change what you're doing and begin to manage it a different way in order that you can find joy and peace and happiness and uh, really, for some of you, maybe even begin to sleep again, right? Because it does affect your sleep and it has a huge effect on your life. Over the past couple of years, with all that our world has been going through, I have found myself personally emotionally struggling. Uh, I don't know about you, but... Uh, I, I, sometimes I feel like I'm just going through the motions, just trying to make it day to day, just trying to get up and do the things that are necessary and, and, and complete the task that I, I got to com, um, complete. And if I am completely honest, there are times my heart is just not in it. I mean, I, I find myself going, man, I just feel disconnected, disconnected from the people I love, disconnected from the things I used to enjoy, disconnected uh, in my heart in ways that I've never been disconnected before. And for me personally, sometimes I find myself wondering, how much longer can I keep this pace up? How much longer can I continue to do the things that I find myself doing with these new demands that the world is currently placing on us? And how life has changed and how things are different than they used to be. And I've tried to maintain a positive attitude. You ever try to do that? You just like, you get up and you say, I'm just going to have a good attitude today. And that lasts about five minutes, right? You turn on the news and you got a bad attitude. I mean, just, it's hard. It's tough. And at times, I've been ready to give up on my dreams, my career, and even my relationships. And I bet that some of you probably have felt this very same way. Why is that? It's because you're probably emotionally tired. And there is a huge difference between emotional and physical. In fact, I entitled this message, Finding the Strength to Keep Going When I'm Emotionally Worn Out. You see, if you're physically worn out, it's very different. In fact, that's pretty easy. All you have to do is get some sleep, rest, and you'll start to feel better. But when you are affected emotionally, it's a lot harder to be able to work through that. And so today, what I want to do in this series, Stress Under New Management, is I want to talk about how do you find the strength to keep going? to get up every day and to keep putting one foot in front of the other and continue to press forward because maybe some of you here today are emotionally worn out. I mean, you woke up this week and you tried to make it through the week and you think to yourself, you know, I I don't have the emotional energy to do this. And you're thinking, I don't know if I can take care of the kids. I don't know if I can get them to school. I don't know if I can go to work. I don't know if I can put up with all the stuff that I have to put up with. And some of you, you've even called into work sick or you've just stayed home because You're emotionally exhausted on the inside. There are others of you that are here today, and maybe because you're emotionally tired, you feel as if you're just going through the motions. You go to work, you punch the clock, you do the things that are necessary, you come home, uh, you cook dinner, you take care of the things that you've got to take care of, and then you just sort of find yourself falling into bed and hoping that you'll be able to get through the next day. You just say, hey, I'm going to try to push forward tomorrow. Or maybe because you're emotionally tired, you have to go through, um, you've thought about throwing in the towel. Maybe you thought about throwing in the towel on your career. Maybe you thought about throwing in the towel in your marriage. And some of you have talked to me about that. And some of you, you talked about your dreams. You know, I just don't dream anymore. These dreams that I was chasing, I don't feel like they're realistic. And I don't feel like I'm going to be able to accomplish them. And you think to yourself, why do I even try? I could be less exhausted just walking away from all of it. Aren't you glad you came to church today? See, that's the reality of the world we live in, and it's where some of you live. Some of you are going, hey, man, I think he was looking in my window this week. I mean, that's exactly how I feel. And maybe because you're emotionally tired, you're having trouble connecting your heart to the things that you love the most, to your career, your marriage, your job, your kids, your family, your heart just isn't in it anymore. 
And I was there, like I found myself at that place and I started asking myself this question. I found myself asking, how do I find strength to keep going when I'm emotionally worn out? How do you get up in the morning and you put one foot in front of the other and you continue to press forward even though emotionally on the inside you feel like, man, I just can't do this. And let me tell you something, if you're here today and you haven't been through any of this, there is going to be a time in your life where you're going to have to keep going even though you emotionally are exhausted and you don't feel like you can. And it's important that we understand that God has something to say about this. And that he knows that we're going to struggle through this. And when we get emotionally tired, there are keys that are important to be able to move forward. And so today, I'm going to teach you four keys that if you'll pick them up and unlock the door to your future, you can have the kind of future that you've dreamed about and what you really want and what God wants for you in your life individually. And so I'm going to share with you four keys today. We're going to look at four keys that are really attitudes that are important that we have to adopt and hold on to and and really begin to uh, think differently if you're going to be able to push forward in these times. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 23, this guy by the name of Paul wrote this, this statement, and it's important to understand that as Paul was writing, he very specifically says something that all of us need to understand. He says this, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. And what he means by that is simply this. There is a truth about living life. And the reality is that most of us, if we aren't careful, we don't listen to the truth about life. That God says, here's the way I designed the world. This is the way I made life. I have a design for your marriage. I have a design for your life. I have a design for your finances. I have a design for you emotionally. Because God, we're created in his image and he's an emotional God. And so you have to understand the emotions you have. They're not bad. It's what you do with them. And so he goes on and he says this, throw off your old sinful nature. And that's where I kind of use the idea of stress under new management. Throw off the old management, the old way of doing life. The sinful things that you have done that do what? Which is corrupted by lust and deception. So what he's saying is your former way of life, uh, you, you, you were corrupted. Why? Because of lust. That's a desire for, right? And sometimes we're emotionally exhausted because we're chasing after things that just don't matter in life. I mean, think about that just for a moment. It just doesn't matter. In fact, I was talking to some people a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about this whole idea. Why is it that when you get in your 50s, you realize you spent your 20s and 30s and 40s chasing things that just weren't important? And you get to 50, and you start looking at life going, wow. I mean, half my life is already gone, and man, I mean, there were so many things that I did that just didn't matter. They weren't important. And so he's saying, like, listen, it's corrupted by lust and deception. You get deceived about life. You get deceived about all of these things. And then here's what he says. He says, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts. And what's the word there? And what? Attitudes. That's interesting to me because attitude is so important. And and when you see it in scripture and you see that he says in your thoughts and your attitudes, he's saying renew your mind the way you think and renew your attitude. Now, why does he say this? He, He says it because of this. Attitude determines altitude. But guys, listen to me. I don't, I don't want you to miss this because it's so important. Your attitude determines how high you fly. It determines a lot of things that happen in your life. Your attitude is so, so important. In fact, I was reading this week, and um, Chuck Swindoll said this. If you don't know who Chuck Swindoll is, he uh, is a very famous guy, a very prominent pastor, and, and, he, and he wrote these words talking about attitude years ago, and so I just wrote it down. I want to read it to you because it just impacted me tremendously as I was reading this. He said, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important than the past. It's more important than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think, say, or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or even skill. Attitude will make or break a company, a church, or even a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day in the attitude that we regard, regarding the attitude we embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in certain ways. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing that we can do is play the one string we have, and that string is our attitude. Listen to what he says. I'm convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I 
react to it. How true is that? Attitude, the impact that it has on your life. In fact, your attitude determines a lot of things. Did you know that your attitude can either push people away or bring people in? Did you know that your attitude can cause you to struggle with depression? Your attitude can cause you to uh, become easily angered. It can be seen as a neg- you can be seen as a negative or a grumpy person because of your attitude. You ever seen somebody and you go, they're just grumpy? It's their attitude. It's the way they look at life. It, it can cause us to create a negative culture rather than a positive culture. It can potentially make or break our business or our company or even our home. It can cause us to contribute to negative factors concerning our health. Your attitude affects what happens to you physically. It can determine your success. Your attitude can steal your joy. It can take out your happiness. It can even smash your dreams and your attitude. It can make or break the relationships that you have. Some of you have broken relationships because someone said, you know what, I just can't put up with that attitude anymore i'm tired of it your attitude has a huge impact on your life and so today what i want to do is i want to talk about this idea of attitude and finding the strength to be able to move forward and i think there's four attitudes that you have to develop in life that you have to focus on that you have to pick up and open the door to your future that you can begin to live the way that god wants you to live and so there's four keys that i want us to embrace in order that we can begin to move forward and find the strength to do the things that we have to do when we're emotionally tired. And so today, I'm going to share those four with you. The first thing that I want to talk about is this, honesty, honesty. And here, I'm just simply saying this, honestly tell God what you're feeling. See, when you're emotionally worn out, that is the time that you need to get honest with God. Now, this is amazing to me because this has changed my life. It has transformed the way that I live. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, I want you to listen to what he says. He says, unload all your burdens onto him since he is concerned about you. God is deeply concerned about you. And when you're emotionally tired, he wants you to come to him, and he wants you to unload is what it says here. It says unload. The idea in the original Greek language, which the New Testament was written in, is that literally you've got this weight on your shoulder and you're just to drop it, just to unload it, to get it off of your shoulder. And so you come to God and you get honest with him. You begin to tell him, hey, God, here's what's going on. I'm angry. I'm tired. I physically don't feel like I can go forward anymore. Uh, You just begin to tell him how you're feeling. God, I'm sad. God, I'm mad. God, I'm frustrated. God, I don't understand. And you get honest with God about the feelings and the emotions that you're experiencing. Now, the reason this is so important is, first of all, God already knows every emotion that you feel. Did you know that? He knows every emotion that you feel. I don't have it on the screen, but in Psalm 33, verse 15, it says, the Lord gave each of us our minds so nothing we think or do can be hidden from him. You can't hide your emotions or your feelings from God. Now, you may be thinking, well, if he knows, then why do I have to tell him? Because it's more about you expressing what you're feeling and what's going on inside of you. And guys, let me tell you something that I began to discover in my own life personally, because I've always been the kind of person that I suppress my emotions. I push them down. But in recent months, I've learned how to express those emotions, to talk about them, to say, hey, that hurt, or hey, I'm sad, or hey, I'm, I'm mad because you said this or this happened. And, and so I just get honest with God. And you know what happens? It lifts a weight off of your shoulders. As you begin to talk about how you feel, as you begin to tell God what's going on on the inside, he already knows. He loves you. He cares about you. But God understands my feelings better than I do. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, it says, The Lord knows what's in everyone's mind, and he understands everything that you think. He already knows. He knows what's on your mind. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what you're dealing with. He wants you to be honest with yourself about it. That you begin to express, hey, here's the thing that's going on. And so the attitude is an attitude of honesty, telling God what I'm feeling. No matter how bad it may be or how good it is, you just express it to God. And let me tell you something else about God. God loves to listen to you. In fact, he's a better listener than anybody, and he longs to listen to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's always there, and he's always ready to listen. He wants to hear your heart. In Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2, David said, I love the Lord because he listens to my prayers. He listens to me every time I call to him, David said. He said, every time I call to God, he's there. Every time I, I, I speak to him, he, he's there for me. In fact, in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 19, listen to what it says. Cry out in the night. 
Pour out your heart like water in prayer to the Lord. So it says just like you would pour out a glass of water, you pour out your emotions and your feelings to God, and you begin to tell him how you feel. And that's the first attitude that we have to have is an attitude of honesty to begin to say to God, God, I'm going to tell you everything that I'm feeling and what's going on on the inside of me. So the first attitude is an attitude of honesty. It's getting honest with God. And it's getting honest with yourself. And and you begin to say, hey, here are the emotions and the feelings that I have. And guys, let me tell you something I'm learning. If you stuff your emotions and feelings, it's only a matter of time before you're going to snap or break or something's going to happen. And and I'm not saying you have to go off on people. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm saying you have to be honest about your emotions and feelings. You see, let me tell you something about myself. And I'm just being really transparent here. This is a, a moment of vulnerability. I'm great at playing the martyr. Somebody says something to me, hurts my feelings, I stuff it down and say, in the name of Jesus, I forgive them, I'm just going to move on. And and you know what? That's not healthy. Now, it doesn't mean that I have to confront them, but it means I have to be honest about how I feel. Ouch, that hurt. You know, that hurt. Why did it hurt? It hurt because maybe it was a a term of disrespect. Maybe it was something that happened and and I need to deal with it in my heart and in my life. And you just got to be honest about your feelings. And the place you start is you begin to tell God what you're feeling. And when you begin to talk to God, you'll be amazed at how it begins to lighten the load in your life. I have felt so much better about being honest with God, being honest with God about how I feel. God, here's what's going on inside of me. The second Uh, The second thing we have to do is we have to have this attitude of humility. And it's one where we say, we humbly ask God for strength. We humbly ask God for strength. Now, this is important because let me tell you something. I I know this about myself and I know this about some of you. you. You probably are depending on yourself or you're depending on someone else for your strength. And you can't do that. So you've got to depend on God because he is ultimately the one that can give you strength. And don't look to anyone else or any other source for strength in your life. In fact, listen to how he puts it in Psalm 105 verse 4. He says it like this. David says, look to the Lord and his strength. He is the strong one. He is the one that will give you strength. He's the one that can help you in the difficult times. And think about it. We often don't look to God for strength. What do we do? We look to other people. Hey, man, can you help me? You know, I I need some strength right now to be able to go on. And and so we will lean on our spouse or we'll lean on our kids or we'll lean on our friends. But we don't go to God who is the source of our strength. Job chapter 12, verse 13, what does Job say? That this guy, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but he says, God is the real source of wisdom and strength. If you really want wisdom, you got to go to God. If you really want strength, you've got to talk to God. You've got to say to God, God, give me the strength to be able to make it, to be able to move forward, to be able to move on. And some of you, you're here, and, and maybe you're kicking the tires of the Christian faith, and you don't believe in God. But I'm here to tell you today, without God, you'll never have the strength that you need. He's the only strength that will get us through. He's the only one that can help us. And so, what is he trying to get us to see here? He's, getting us to, he's trying to get us to see and to understand that you've got to humbly come to God and ask him for strength, and not just in the morning. See, see, that was a mistake that I made. Every day I'd get up and say, God, I just need your strength today. But you know what I'm learning now? I need to ask him a hundred times a day. God, I need your strength in this meeting. God, I need your strength as I counsel this, por- this person. God, I need your strength as I deal with this situation. God, I need your strength as I'm driving to work to be alert and aware and and just to depend on you. And so a hundred times a day, just asking God, God, give me strength. God, help me because you say that if I will ask that you'll answer and I'm coming to you and I'm asking you for strength. And it's amazing how you begin to get strength, that God begins to strengthen you as you continually ask him to give you strength. And then in Psalm 3, verse 5, listen to what it says. It says, I can lie down and go to sleep and I'll wake up again because the Lord gives me strength. Now, I'm going to say this because I think some of you need to hear this. But did you know that when your relationship with God is broken, it affects your sleep? Some of you are going, well, how do you know that? Uh, scientifically, I was reading this week, week they have proven that when, you have, when, you, when you're under stress and your relationship with God is not where it needs to be, it affects your sleep. And i got to tell you, I mean, here's what David's saying. I can lie down and go to sleep. Why can he lie down and go to sleep and and wake up again? Because the Lord gives me strength. David's saying, my relationship with God is exactly where it needs to be. And some of you today, can I tell you something? You may not be able to sleep outside of a medical condition. Let me tell you this. The problem may be 
that you're not where you need to be in your relationship with God. And because you're not talking to him, because you're not walking with him, because your relationship with God is strained, it does something physically on the inside, and you can't be at peace. You can't have joy. You can't experience happiness as, as, you, as you're not walking with him. And so guess what? Humility moves God to answer your prayers. When we get to him and we say, God, I need you. I don't need anything else in this life. I don't need anybody else. I don't need anything else except for you because God, ultimately, my strength comes from you. And so we humbly ask God for strength and don't depend on someone else. It's the only way that we'll continue to be able to move forward and to get through this life when we find ourselves emotionally drained. So the key to having daily strength to keep going is that you honestly tell God what you're feeling and then you humbly ask God for strength. And then number three, notice this one, the third one. It's an attitude of, of gratitude. It's being grateful. Gratefully, thank God for all that's good. Now, I'm going to stay here for a second because I think this one is so important. We're going to look into the life of Job, and Job, very specifically, a man who lost everything in one day. If you've never read the book of Job or heard the story of Job, in one, in one day, Job lost everything in his life. Terrorists killed his family. He found himself at a place that he lost all of his economic uh, wealth. He was, he was one of the wealthiest men in the world. And he lost everything. If anybody had a reason to be uptight, if anybody had a reason to, to emotionally be drained, it was Job. But Job refused not to be grateful for, for, what, what, for who God was and what was happening in his life. Now, listen to me very carefully. I want to show you this passage of Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, it doesn't say for all circumstances, does it? It says, but in every circumstance of life, you have to find a way, an attitude of gratitude, a way to be grateful, to be thankful. Now, I, I'm not saying, and I want you to hear me, I'm going to be very clear on this. I'm not saying that if you get diagnosed with cancer, uh, you need to be thankful. That is, that is not what he's saying here. I'm not saying that if a child gets hurt, that you're to be thankful. That is not what he's saying here. If someone gets uh, you know, hurt in an automobile accident, he's not saying to be thankful for that. He's saying in that circumstance, be grateful for something. There's something that you can be grateful for. There's, there's an attitude of gratitude that you can have in your heart. For this is God's will. What is God's will? That in all circumstances, uh, as you're in Christ Jesus, that, that, that in all circumstances you give thanks. That is God's will. You may be walking around saying, what's God's will for my life? God's will is that in everything that happens in life, you give thanks. You find an attitude of gratitude. And can I tell you something? This will change your life. Because let me tell you this. If, you, if you're like me, if you watch TV and you, 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 know, you see the news and other things going on in the world, you can get a bad attitude really quick, right? And, and, and when things happen in your life, like when my wife was diagnosed with cancer years ago, you can get a bad attitude really quick. You can start having a pity party, and I did, and when I got into the book of Job and I saw what happened to Job, I was like, wow, I mean, Job was able to find good in the middle of bad, and he had this attitude of gratitude. So I'm going to ask you to do something this week. I want you to find a, a little place that you can write, whether it's in your phone, whatever it is, and every day I want you to spend a little bit of time, even if your circumstances are bad, especially when your circumstances are bad, find a way to show gratitude to God for who he is. God, here's some things I'm thankful for. I, I am grateful that you love me in spite of the circumstances that I find myself in. God, I am grateful that you are in complete control. That, that even though uh, as we look out at the world, we, we sometimes wonder what in the heck is going on. God, you're in control. It's ultimately in your hands. And so Job, listen to what he does. Job chapter two, uh, 1, verses 20 and 22. It says, in grief, that is, as he lost his entire family, Job tore his robe, shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground, and he worshiped God. But guys, that's despair. His life couldn't have been any more miserable in that moment, and he, what did he do? He chose to worship God, an attitude of gratitude. God, I'm thankful. I'm going to worship you. He said, I was born with nothing, and I will die with nothing. Job said, you know, I had all this stuff. God gave it to me, and, and Job's the one that says, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then he goes on, the Lord gave, and now he has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In spite of everything, he's saying, and the loss of my family, and all of my wealth, and everything that has happened in this day, at the end of this day that has happened, Job did not sin by blaming God. He never blamed God. 
He didn't say, God, I can't believe you allowed this to happen to me. Job showed that he was grateful. And man, when you read through the book of Job, I don't have time to do all of this, but I just want to just show you some things that I saw. Job said, I'm thankful that God is loving and cares for me. Job chapter 10, verse 12. He just is saying to God, God, in spite of everything that's happened, I'm thankful that you care about me, that you love me. And then he said, God, I'm thankful that, that you have a detailed plan for my life. Job chapter 23, verse 14. He's telling God, you got a plan. And in spite of everything that's happened, your plan is still going to be fulfilled. And if you follow the story of Job, God restores a double portion to Job of everything that he had. God had a plan. God knew exactly what he was doing. And then it says, um, God is in control of what I don't understand. Job 34, verse 13, he said, I don't understand the circumstances, don't understand the situation, don't understand why these things happen to me. I'm not blaming you, God, but I'm grateful, God, that I can trust you, that you're in control, even though I don't understand. And then he goes on in Job chapter 23, verse 10, that God will reward me after I'm tested. He said, you know, this is a test in my life. All these things happen, and he said, I just want to be faithful and, and, and he just has this attitude of gratitude that in spite of everything that has gone on, he is going to, what, he, he's going to do what? He's going to thank God. Listen to this verse. I wrote this verse down, Psalm 63, verse 2. Here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength, O God. Worship is a huge part of finding strength. Worship is a huge part of of showing gratitude to God. And in just a few moments, as we get ready to close the service, we're going to sing a song again because we're going to show gratitude to God. I want you to start this week off thanking God for who he is and what he's done and being able to worship him because he is who he says he is because worship gives you strength and it gives you the ability to be able to move forward. And man, let me just be be transparent with you. Sometimes some of you, you miss worship. Can I tell you something? You're missing out on something that God has uniquely designed you for so that you can be filled up and you can find strength and you can go out into this week and even in the circumstances of life, you can find gratitude because of who God is. And then lastly, the last attitude we have to have is an attitude of uh, consistency and and it's an attitude where we're constantly keeping God as our focus. We constantly say, I'm going to keep God as my focus. I'm going to keep God as the focus of everything that I do. Now, let me just ask you a question before we move through a couple of scriptures. What do you think about most these days? I want you to be honest with yourself. What do you think about most these days? What does your mind drift towards? What are you constantly thinking about? And, and, and I'll tell you, there's some things in my life, man, that I, I find myself like just sitting and thinking and just, you know, just kind of thinking about some things about the future. But is my focus on God? Or is my focus on my circumstances? Is my focus on the situation? Is my focus on the things that, that are happening in my life? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, talking about Jesus, Luke writes these words. He says, we must focus on Jesus, the source and goal of our faith. He saw the joy ahead of him, so he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace it brought him. And then he received the highest position in heaven. Now there's a lot of spiritual truths packed in this passage of scripture. But here's what it's saying. It's saying that when Jesus went to the cross and he was enduring the pain that he was going through and he was being ridiculed and mocked and all these things were happening to him, he said that basically Jesus saw the joy ahead of him. So he what? He endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace it brought to him. Here's what it was saying. Jesus got his eyes off of his circumstances, and he put his eyes on the joy that was promised to him by his father, and he was looking out into the future, the future joy that he had been promised. And it was the thing that gave him the endurance to be able to move forward, the thing that gave him the endurance to endure what he was going to endure there on that cross. He wasn't focused on the circumstances. And how many times do we get focused on the circumstances, right? And we just, we're, we're, we're pitying in our situation. Uh, we just can't keep God as the focus. God, you're the focus. 
And you know what? You told me that I'm a sojourner in this world and I'm only here for a short time and then one day I'm going to be leaving this world and I'm going to spend trillions of years in eternity. And when I focus on that and I think about the future that God has for me where it is going to be perfect in every way, it gives me the endurance to be able to endure emotionally in the moment. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 4 verses 16 and 18, it says this, this is why we never give up. Our spirits are being renewed every day. How are they being renewed? Our present troubles are small and won't last very long. So Paul was saying, you know what? What we're going through in this world, it's just temporary. Man, we're moving on. We're going beyond this world. And so he was able to say, our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever. He's talking about the glory of God and the idea that he's going to live in eternity. And then he goes on and he says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not, not what's around us, our circumstances and the situations. We're looking way beyond that, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Man, have you ever got yourself in a situation where you find yourself pitying in the circumstances that you're in? Can't believe that person treated me that way. Can't believe I lost my job. Can't believe they acted like that. Can't believe I'm in this situation. Why in the world is this happening to me? But man, when you start looking towards the future and you start thinking about God having a plan for your life and that he is in control, your attitude begins to change and you just fix your eyes on the author of the race, God, the one who created you, has made you, and who will sustain you. And, and then you begin to move forward in life. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 11, listen to what he says. He says, we are praying that you will be filled with his mighty, glorious strength so that you can keep going. He's saying, if you want to keep going, focus on God. Don't focus on the news. You're dead in the water. It's going to be negative. Don't focus on your boss. Don't focus on your circumstances. Don't focus on the current situation. Put your eyes on Jesus, who is the perfecter and the finisher of your faith. And as you look to him, he'll give you the strength to go no matter what happens. Always full of joy of the Lord. And so there's these attitudes, these keys that we're talking about today. So what are the keys? It's very simple. The first key is you got to honestly tell God what you're feeling. you got to be honest about your emotions. The second key is humbly ask God for strength. God, give me strength to be able to make it through this day. And don't just ask him once. Ask him all day. God, I need your strength. God, I need your strength. God, I'm asking you to give me strength. God, would you give me wisdom? God, would you walk with me in the middle of all of this that's going on? And then thirdly, do what? Gratefully thank God for all that's good. Even though there's bad around you, begin to look at the good things. And man, let me tell you if, you, if you don't do anything else this week, go home and start making a list of the things you've got to be grateful for. Your attitude will change just like that. And you'll begin to say, wow, I've got so much good in my life to be thankful for. Man, I'm thankful that I live in the United States of America, no matter how bad it gets, because it sure is better than a lot of other places in this world. I'm thankful for the freedom that I have. I'm thankful for the blessings that God has given me. I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for the friendships. I'm thankful that in a few weeks, hunting season starts. There's so much to be thank thankful for. I mean, I could stand up here all day, and when, when you start writing it down, you just start going, why in the world am I having a pity party? What, what am I complaining about? I'm thankful that Carmen's going to have my deer stand ready. Praise Jesus. I mean, it's all good things. And so there's one thing that I want to ask you to do this week. And I'm asking everybody to do it for a week. I'm asking you to pick up the keys and to unlock the door to your future. Man, if you'll change your attitude, can I tell you something? Your future will be bright. It'll be the kind of future where you pull people in rather than push people out. It'll be the kind of future where you begin to experience joy rather than depression and you begin to experience happiness as you begin to live your life. Where you'll be happy rather than being angry. It'll be a future where you are seen as a positive and motivating person rather than a negative and grumpy person, where you create a positive culture rather than a negative culture, where it makes your business and your company and your home a better place to be because guess what? 
you determine the temperature of what's going to happen, where you contribute to positive factors concerning your health, where your success is determined, where your joy is expressed rather than stolen or taken away from you, where all of a sudden your happiness is given rather than taken, where dreams are built rather than smashed, where relationships are restored rather than broken. Pick up the keys. Unlock the door. Change your attitude and watch what begins to happen. I'm telling you, emotionally, you will start feeling better. You will find yourself with a lot less stress, and your world will just begin to be a better place because you have decided, I'm going to grab the keys, and I'm going to open the door to the future that God has, and it's a future that is blessing rather than a future that is chaotic and not full of joy and happiness. Because even in circumstances, you can find joy and so today, we're going to sing. We're going to, we're going to glorify God and be grateful to him for who he is. And I want, to, I want you to watch how it changes, how you leave this place today, and how your life will begin to be different. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is so true, that God, every time we come together to worship, that in the midst of worship, we can find not only you, but God, we can find reasons to be grateful and hearts that are full of gratitude. And God, I believe that so many of us are stressed out. So many of us are emotionally worn out. So many of us are at a place in our life that we don't even know how we're going to get up tomorrow and accomplish the task that we need to accomplish and to do the things that we know need to get be done because emotionally we're just worn out. But God, you give us the keys to the right attitude. Because attitude determines altitude. And God, some of us are flying way, way below where we should be because our attitude is just not right. And there are so many attitude stealers that come in and rob us of the joy and the happiness and the peace. And I pray that, God, you would help us to have the kind of attitude that really begins to tell you how we feel. And then, God, the kind of attitude that allows us to be grateful in the midst of difficult circumstances to find the good, to see the good, to be grateful for the great things that you have done in our lives. And then God, to be consistently looking to you and not anyone else for our strength, knowing that you will help us. And so Father, I pray that as we sing this song together, that you would change our attitude, that you would change our heart, And I pray that as we pick up the keys and we unlock the door to our future, that God, this week would be a better week because we've been with you. And so we just pray that you would help us to drink it in now as we worship. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.